I don't know what I've done really to deserve Micah. I noticed when Grant mentioned him before, everybody's shoulders slumped. Why can't we have something gentle Jesus, meek and mild? We've got Micah. And look, I tell you, if you've never dug in to an Old Testament prophet, you're missing a lot. It can look daunting at first, and this was daunting. And I thought at first, this is so barren and discouraging, but after I read it a couple of times, I began to see things. Well, not so much. Yeah, I did. I saw things, but the Lord started showing me things. And uh, some of it was very personal. And so I ended up going from a barren couple of chapters to pages and pages of notes. Uh, I've known for about three weeks that this is coming up. And I've had about four attempts at writing the sermon, but everyone's been a message to me from Micah. So if you've closed Micah after Will read it, I'm sorry, but can you find it again, please? I'll give you a bit of time because, well, can I suggest the best place to find Micah is in the table of contents in the front. He's, uh, he's one of those little books just before the New Testament. Why is he a minor prophet? He's a minor prophet. Him and his companions there at the back of the Old Testament are minor prophets only because they're short books, that's all. They call people to repentance. Um, the major prophets are a, a little bit different because they're longer. They cover a wider range of topics, judgment, restoration, messianic prophecies, and so on. <clears throat> but it's all designed mainly to call people to repentance. And that raises a question for me, why does God think it's so important to have this kind of message come to us as regularly as we find it in the prophets of the Old Testament? There's got to be a reason. See, in verse 2, going backwards a bit, I'm going to start with verse 2, then go back to verse 1. It says, attention, let all the people in the world listen. So while he was talking to Israel in the first instance, and Judah, because the nation was split then, he was actually seeing beyond the immediate down the line to us. That's the, that's the way of these prophets. And they don't see very clearly. It's like driving in the Waikato in a fog. But they see enough for us, as we look at it now in our context, to be able to draw from it. So in verse 1, Micah of Morasheth. Well, Morasheth is interesting because it actually means who is like Yahweh, God, who is like Yahweh. And they think that's not his name so much as what he was known for because later on in Micah, this comes up a few times. Who is like Yahweh? And so <clears throat> that's what Morasheth is. And the kings that are mentioned, I'm sorry, what I'm saying, Micah is like, um, who is like Yahweh. He's in Morasheth, which was a little village about 40 kilometers south of Jerusalem, over towards the coast, towards the Philistines area. So he was a country boy, he was a rural boy. And he, was, he mentions three kings there, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Ahaz was a bit of a rogue. In fact, he was evil. Hezekiah was probably the, the best king they had, short of David. He was certainly better than Solomon. But you know, the history, I don't know how well you can see that, but Israel there was split off from Judah down here after Solomon's reign. Now Solomon ended up being a pretty bad sort of a king. He started off real well, finished real bad. And as a result of that, largely, 
the kingdom was split. Now the center of Israel, I'll get the right button here. The, the center of Israel was Samaria up there. And of course, Judah, as we know, was Jerusalem down there. And they were at war. Now Samaria was conquered. It was conquered when the Assyrians came in and they took us Samaria and they went on. They wanted to take Jerusalem, but they didn't. They laid siege to it for a while. But this is the context that Micah was speaking in. Let the Lord be a witness against you. He talks in verse 5 about the sins of the nation and the sins of Samaria. It's important to understand that when these two nations split off from Israel, Samaria wanted to do its own thing. God had said earlier on that the place to worship me will be in the temple in Jerusalem, but Samaria wanted to set up their own worship in their own way, in their own place. And of course, it was mixed with worship of the, of the tribes that they were meant to expel from the land. And so it became worship on the high places because traditionally the high places where they would set up their, their worship and there was various forms of worship or various gods that they worshipped. Ashima was the main Canaanite goddess that they worshipped. And that's why God says he's going to trample the high places, the mountains melt beneath his feet in verse 4. God has got a real problem when his people turn their back on him and start absorbing the things of the world around them, the things that they're meant to cast out so they can possess the land. Now, along with the sins of Samaria, there's, Mike is talking about I found it interesting. Prosperity preachers. I don't know if that rings a bell with you. It should, because we have plenty of them even today. And the whole idea of the prosperity preacher is the one to make us feel comfortable, self-satisfied, to lose our edge in Christ, to lose our, our desire for the things of Christ, and allow the desires of the world around us to come into our life, you know, and they will do that in the name of God. And they'll say peace where there is no peace. They'll say comfort where there is no comfort, or like they say here, and I think he's being a little bit cynical, he talks about, oh, well, just drink some more and have a good time. It's fine. You're all good. You've got everything you need. Don't think too much about the deeper things of life. Don't think too much about what God has said. Don't think too much about the fact that judgment is coming. Now, it's amazing just how easily we, and I know it's true of you because it's certainly true of me, can have the things of the world soak in to us. You know, we, we're like a tea bag in a cup of hot water. We just absorb the hot water, become diffused and confused by the things of the world that we're living in and we pick it up almost unwittingly and there's only one way that we can we can prevent that only one way and it's by being proactive in seeking God you know and, and we we stand up the front here every Sunday and I know we often beat the same, same drum about the devotional life and getting into the word but this is why it's so important because there's no other way we can stand and we can certainly think we're standing but as Paul the apostle said we've got to take heed in case we fall when we think we're standing and sin is nasty and it creeps up on us now Assyria <coughs> came in from the north and 720 BC and it took um, the 10 tribes 
of Israel, the northern part of the country, took 10 tribes captive, and that's basically the end of them. We don't know anything about them. And you might have heard about the lost tribes of Israel. Well, that's the 10 tribes. And Judah thrived. It thrived under King Uzziah. It was very comfortable until they were invaded by the Babylonians a couple of hundred years later. And the Babylonians were a little bit different. They took all of the top people of society, all the educated people and the business people and the leaders they took back to Babylon just to bolster their own culture, enrich their own nation. And they left the farmers and everybody else back in the land of Judah. And that's, you know, those are like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that's where they went, was in Babylon. The history is really fascinating. But you notice some things, you know, with reading the Bible history in the Old Testament and also the history of Rome and, and, and later civilizations. It's the same thing. Prosperity and comfort brings problems to God's people. It always does. It always does. You know, what do nations look for? They look for peace. They look for prosperity. But as you look at nations, they get more and more corrupt as time goes by. And even in our nation, I mean, you look at it, politics is never going to provide the answer. It disturbs me how many Christians get really passionate about a political party. But, you know, it doesn't matter which side of the spectrum you might be leaning towards, that will never solve the problems that we have in our nation. You know, I just look at the people who say, oh, well, I've noticed down the end of our street, kind of, uh, what is the old housing corp? Yeah. They're building these three-storied high-rise places. And I see people on the street. And in, in the work I do, I often come across people on the street. And sometimes I'll, I'll help them. But, you know, I feel compassion for them. But when I see these houses, my first thought is, oh, what kind of neighbours are we going to have? Are we going to have end-to-end -end dom domestic disputes and parties? And so we have this conflict in our society and there is no answer for it. And where do we place ourselves in this? How do I respond to these things? You see, while Micah is talking about nations, nations are made up of you and I. So nations are going to be judged according to Jesus. And what does that mean for me? Now, I can't change the course of this nation, and neither can you, neither can um, the government. So where does that leave us as Christians? Well, I don't think there's a simple answer for it. I mean, I can tell you what I think the answer for me is, but the answer for you will be different. But the point in all of this is we've got to be aware of this, we've got to be awake to this, and we've got to be responding by looking to God. Lord, what would you have me do? There may not be something in, in my nation, but I've got to make myself useful for the kingdom of God, for his glory, somehow. He expects that of me because Michael warns us judgment is coming. And Jesus talks a lot, like in Matthew 25, he talks about what the talents, the, the wise and foolish virgins, Oh, when did you see me hungry, naked, in prison and, and visit you, Lord? That's all in Matthew 25. As you read that, as Christians, with the Holy Spirit in our hearts, there's got to be a response somehow from us. If we're not responding to things, if we're not constantly judging ourselves, I think we're in trouble. We're heading for trouble. Judah had wealth under Uzziah. They had wealth, they had comfort, but they had complacency growing. 
they had lukewarmness growing because of their comfort, because of their wealth. And that's a danger for us because I don't, I don't know how hard or easy it is for you in life today, but we have it good compared to two-thirds of the world. And so what do we do? What are we doing? I mean, we can't all be pastors or preachers or missionaries. or We can't. But we can be asking God, Lord, how do I respond? How do I live as a Christian in this environment in a way that is going to count for your glory? Big or small. I've got a friend. I've known him for about 15 years in Malawi, which is one of the poorest countries. He's a local, and he's a pastor. And he's got a church of about six people in a village that is Muslim. And he emails me every so often, and we go backwards and forwards, and really all I've been able to do just is when I get his emails is pray for him and look in the word for something to send to him to encourage him. And I'm just so grateful to God for what I have, for the life he's given me. It's so much easier than him. But I don't want to end up like the, poor, like the Lazarus. You know, he had the poor man at his gate. I don't know if you remember this story. I forget where it is. Luke 10, I think. And remember, the, the beggar wanted crumbs and he didn't even get the crumbs. And then when Lazarus died and faced a judgment... He found out that the beggar was actually better off eternally than he was. And, and, I mean, this challenges me, and it should challenge us. And that's what I want Micah to do for us this morning, is to challenge us so we stop and think, Lord, am I just taking up space? I mean, even if it's only making a note to myself, to pray for someone in Malawi, you know? I mean, I pray for the people I love. I pray for the people around me. When, when things come into my, across my path, I'll pray for them. That's fine and, and, and good and proper. But what about the Lord's world? What about his influence on the sinful world that we live in? What about... His kingdom coming. Not just the Lord's prayer, but a piece of his kingdom that I can focus on and pray for and, the, and maybe give to. And, you know, even if I can send $50 to Malawi, when you convert their currency and see how much wheat that buys or maize, you realize that you're actually doing something really worthwhile for them at that end. And so Micah's warning comes, I, I think, and I heard, it shocked me, I heard somebody who actually was a ministry leader once say, well, God has been blessing us financially. We've had all the income we need. So we must be pleasing God. And it really struck me, you know, how we live like that. We measure our progress in the kingdom of God by the currency of the world. And he was actually talking about a works righteousness. If I'm doing something to please God, he's going to reward me with the money I need for my ministry. You know, and, and I realized that this man, he was a good Christian brother and I loved him dearly. And what do I say to him? But it's the world creeping in, you see, and we don't always see it in ourselves unless we go to the Lord and ask him to look into our lives. Because there are two things that never change. God's faithfulness to his promises. But you see, he also promises judgment not just the good things, there's conditions on God's covenant. And he's faithful to keep his promise. 
And the second thing is mankind's total inability to stay faithful to God. The world is always, always pulling at me. So God kept his promise of judgment and this is from 2 Kings. In the ninth year, of Hosea, king of Assyria, captured Samaria and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the customs of their nations. One of the things I notice about the prophets is they're always referring back to the Exodus. You know, the greatest thing, the greatest miracle in, in Israel's history was the Exodus. And you remember, if you've read the account of the Exodus, how they're meant to remember it and there was festivals set to remember it by so that the children and the children's children would know how God had delivered the, the nation from slavery and yet how quickly they forgot as you read through Exodus. But you see, even here, they're reminding the people, you've, he's saying you forgot about the great things I've done for you in the past. You forgot about them. And because of that, you've feared other gods and you've walked in their customs. And then in verse 15 of Kings, 2 Kings 17, they despised his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went after false idols and became false. That's interesting. I go after a false idol, I become false. I don't have to go after a false idol. False idols are after me. Remember right back when sin came into the world and God said to Adam, sin crouches at the door. Sin crouches at the door. It's personified like a person or an animal crouching ready to pounce. And so the false idols come after us when we go after them and we become false and they followed the nations that were around them and this is it, we spend more time in the news and thinking about politics than we do in God's word then we're following the nations around us, aren't we? I mean this these are some of the things that challenged me as I got into my car, I wasn't even thinking about this Sunday service, I was thinking about myself because I've got an addiction to the news. And I can't tell you how often I've said to God, oh Lord, I need, forgive me, I need to put your word first. And I do for a few days, but then something happens, something big is happening. And so I want to find out and I think, well, I've just woken up so I'm a bit tired and I haven't drunk my first coffee yet, so I'll just have a look at the news. And I don't know why I do it. It seems so silly standing up here and saying this to you because there's no news going on in the news that is anything as good as the good news. And that's what I need to feed myself with. I need to be preaching to myself. So Samaria today... I've been there. I mean, not the area of Samaria, I mean the, the city. All of the stones and the, and the rubble from the buildings has all been rolled down into the valley. And this is what conquerors do. They tear down the walls, they tear down the cities. They did it to Jerusalem, the Babylonians did. And Jerusalem has been conquered so many times in its history, it's just incredible. And yet, and Samaria, there's nothing there except there's some vines and grapevines and, and things growing and you go into the valleys and it's full of all this rubble. You see, God is faithful to keep his promise. And so he is going to come and he is going to come and judge us. It's interesting that archaeologists working in Jerusalem, 
there's a, um, by the pool of Shalom, down on the Temple Mount, which is part of the, you know, where the big gold dome is of the Islamic temple, where the mosque is, they've dug through layers down, down, down. And you can actually walk down around the old walls at the same levels where Jesus was, which is kind of fascinating. You're in a big trench because they've dug down to the Jesus level. But there's levels below that, and they've got down to Micah's level. And you know what they've found at Micah's level? They've found hundreds of idols, little idols, household idols, that the people of God have put in their homes. So Micah 2 is all about why the judgment. It's about covetousness. It's about violence to others, like stealing their land. It's about injustice. And you know, these are all things that God hates. And he hates injustice because he's a loving God. We don't understand. But God's justice is part of his love. People say, oh, why would God punish people? Well, he has to because he's a God of love. If wrongs have been done, they've got to be judged. They've got to be put right. So this is our battle today, my brothers, my sisters. It's the old saying, out of sight, out of mind. And I want to challenge you. How does your life look in this area? Are we just going from Sunday to Sunday and whoops, it's Sunday again and, and has my life really counted Monday to Saturday? You know, just the small things. Do we come before God and say, Lord, would you take a look at my life? Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Well, Jesus didn't have a lot of money to give. But look at the way he worked with people. Look at the way he prayed to his father. Look at the impact that he had. And I'm not saying we can have the same impact. But if... He, by his spirit, is living in me. I've got to have some impact. There's got to be something I can do. There's got to be a reason for me to take up space and be breathing God's air. Oh, hang on. I, I double-clicked. In fact, I triple-clicked. That's what I wanted was John 12, 47 to 48. This is what I love about Jesus. And I'm just so grateful that he did not come to judge. Because if he came to judge last time, I'd be, I'd be gone, Berger. I would be. I wouldn't have a shred of hope. No, he didn't come to judge. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me because so often that's me not obeying him. For I have come to save the world and not to judge it. Now here's the, here's the zinger on the end. But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth I have spoken. Again, Matthew 25. My talents. What talents do I have? How can I be using them? I don't know what talents I have. Well, I can be praying and asking God and saying, Lord, use me. Show me what I can do, what I can give, what I can be that will make a difference. This is Paul speaking, 1 Corinthians 11, 31 to 32. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way.
So what can I say? What can I say? We need to just finish off in chapter 2 of Micah, just because Micah, while he looks through the Waikato fog into the future, doesn't quite see it, but he sees it in, in an outline. And from verse 12 of chapter 2, Someday, O Israel, I will gather you. I will gather the remnant who are left. I will bring you together again like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. Now Jesus expanded on that, didn't he? We're part of that flock. Yes, your land will again be filled with noisy crowds. Your leader will break out and lead you out of exile. That's Jesus. Looking through the fog, that's Jesus. He's our leader, going to lead us out of exile as well as the Israelites. Your king will lead you. The Lord himself will guide you. So out of sight, out of mind doesn't cut it with Jesus. We've got to judge ourselves because there's no neutrality in this world. We can't be neutral. We're either moving forward or we're slipping back. And if we're slipping back, we probably don't even see it until something smacks us in the face, which is probably God's judgment to discipline us and bring us back like a wayward sheep that needs a, a tap with a rod to get us back in with the flock. Thank God for his judgment. Now. So... We've got to remember that two things never change. I'll just go back to this, this verse again. See, I've highlighted I have come to save the world and not to judge it. So two things never change. It's the world. That's not going to change. Or yes, it's going to get worse. Me? Well, I'm changing. I am day by day, but only as I come before him and open my heart to him and make sure that my heart is pure, repent of the sins, I mean the, the dozens of them that I do every day in my thoughts and my words and my deeds. I, I don't even know what they all are, but I can say to God, Lord, I just don't want to be doing this sort of stuff that I do and I know there's dark things in my heart still help me with that but the other thing I need to be praying is Lord when did I see you hungry when did I see you naked when did I see you in prison and I'm challenged because you may know I sometimes deliver Uber Eats for my coffee money but I meet these beggars sitting outside McDonald's and I'll buy them a feed and then I, but I find myself judging them. And, and I've got to bring that before the Lord because the Lord doesn't ask me to judge them. He just says if they have a need, give it to them. You know, and don't expect to be paid back. And so if I'm trusting the Lord, even if I'm short of money, Lord, help me to dig into my pocket and buy him some food even if that's the last of my spending money till next week. Because I'm trusting you, Lord, because you also said you'd supply all my needs. You see, I've got to be moving forward in these areas because one day I'm going to stand before God and my prayer and my desire is I'll be able to say, oh, wonderful Jesus, my Lord, my Saviour, I've been able to do this so that your name is glorified, so that your kingdom comes. Lord, here's, here's what I've been doing for you. Here's how I've spent my talents. I've multiplied them. And I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
enter into your rest. When you saw that hungry beggar, you dipped into your pocket. You didn't know, but that was me, and you fed me. When you wrote an email and you, and you spent time praying and looking for a scripture to encourage that man and his work in Malawi, you didn't know, but you were doing that to me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for people like Micah. I know there's so much more in Micah. And, but, oh God, we need to be reminded so constantly of who you are, of your faithfulness to your promises. Not only your promise to bless, but your promise to judge. And Lord, we don't need to fear your judgment. But oh Lord, we do need to be prompted to seek your face daily to put ourselves in right relationship with you through our desires and our works. Lord, not that these works get us to heaven, not like that man who said, oh, well, we must be doing something right because God has blessed us. It's not that at all, Father. We do it because we love you and we want to spend eternity with you in the full joy of the Lord. And Father, we recognize that you've put us on this earth, whether it's for whether we've known you for one year when we die or, or 50 years or even one day like the thief on the cross, it doesn't matter because faithfulness in the time we've got is what counts. So help us to be a faithful people, Father, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.